My topic today is um, supremacy of Christ in postmodernism. Supremacy of Christ in postmodernism. I'll read a few verses because of time, then uh, we'll be able to be reading them as we go. Uh, in the book of Colossians, which is my anchor scripture, uh, book of Colossians, uh, chapter number two, uh, the Bible says, I want you to know how much I'm struggling for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not met me personally, my purpose is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding argument. I want you to mark that. For though I'm absent from body, you... Um, absent uh, from you in body, I'm present with you in spirit and delight to see how orderly you are and how firm your faith is in Christ. Lord, I thank you once more for your word. I pray for my listener in this second service. I pray that your presence and your glory may saturate, may envelop this place this uh, afternoon. May you speak to every heart. May I decrease as you increase in me, O oh God. We bless you and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um, uh, the book that you've been told is um, uh, records, is, a, is a, also a biography of my 26 years of preaching the gospel. I started preaching as a young boy. Uh, they used to call me Wonder Boy. Uh, because they marveled at the preaching of this young, small boy, and God has raised me to up to where I am today. So you could be having maybe a, a child, you could be having somebody you're mentoring, you could buy that book, because I've shared my life in all uh, that book, apart from the heavy uh, theological part of the Pentecostal, uh, God will be able to bless you on that. Supremacy of Christ in postmodernism. Now, uh, when we come, when we talk about postmodernism, uh, before we reach postmodernism, there is pre modernity. And the pre modernity is the generalization of the subjective world. Uh, so, the world in which everyone looks, the one, uh, the lenses to which everyone looks at the world at their subjective level. And then we move from pre-modernity, which is a more primitive era, into modernity. Modernity uh, is where the age of enlightenment is also included. And there is a shift in focus from uh, subjectivity to objectivity when it comes uh, to modernity. That has also shifted or has also metamorphosized uh, from uh, modernity. Now we move to post-modernity. And the 21st century is part and parcel of post-modernity. In other words, you and myself, we are living in an era of post-modernity or post-modernism. Now, my sermon is just to highlight some of the identity and the principles of postmodernity and how they interplay and how Christ come as a supreme being in our life, especially within the context of Christendom or the context of Christianity. Hallelujah. And so I look at the principles of postmodernity and then give it a biblical response on the 10 chapters that I've just read in the book of Colossians chapter 2. Now let's look at the principles. What are the principles of postmodernism? Number one is what we call uh, cultural relativism. Somebody say cultural relativism. Cultural relativism. 
Now, in cultural relativism, it states that there is no absolute truth. Everyone judges according to their lenses or their worldviews. So, have you ever heard people saying, it depends with how you see it. Have you ever seen young people cohabiting? They have not been legally married. They have not been blessed in the altar. But they say, pastor, it depends with how you see it. In other words, everybody has a lens to look at moralism in a way that they think. They interpret things according to their worldviews, according to their background, according to their persuasion, and even doctrinal beliefs. Glory be to the name of Jesus. That is the age of cultural relativism. Now, it opens doors for even, uh, it, it opens doors for thoughts that even goes to the extreme of moralism. It depends on how you look at it. You tell them, listening to secular music is a sin. And they tell you, Pastor, it depends with that. This song is too sweet for me to leave. It just depends with how you look at it. But the Bible says that faith comes by hearing and by the hearing of the word of God. In other words, what you hear, even including the lyrics of the music, needs to be founded on the scripture. Hallelujah. It depends with how you look at it. No wonder some people come to church, but from Monday to Friday, they are taking wine, they are taking opium, they are taking Smynov, and they say, even Paul advises Timothy to take a little, to take a little for their stomach's sake. Now, you wonder, do they have the same trouble? Do they have the same problem? Do they have the same Chronic stomach illness like that of Timothy. But it's just cultural relativism. Now, pastor had just reminded me, I'm told in, here in the Rift Valley, there is some, something called koito. Have I pronounced it well? <laughs> that once people go to koito, they don't come to the altar and receive the blessing of the elders and the priest in their marriages. It's part of cultural relativism because we look at it from our own anthropological and cultural eyes. And so if it is good, I go for it. Cultural relativism. Glory be to the name of Jesus. The second one is what we call information explosion. Somebody say information explosion. We are in the information age, and I want to believe that most of you here coming to this church, you have some gadgets, hallelujah. Where I come from, we carry machines, hallelujah. You have some gadgets there that you can Google something and it comes. Now, in the age of information explosion, just by a, a click of a button or the use of a search engine, you can be able to get information on your screen. Glory be to the name of Jesus. And I was saying in the morning, in this era, I sympathize with doctors. Because how many are medics here? Because people come to you as a medic when they have already Googled their ailments. So you send them to the library, but they are so subjective in their thinking and they are feeling, doctor, this is what is making me sick. This is my sickness. They now don't believe in that research, that scientific research. They say, this is what? This is my disease. I also sympathize with the teachers, lecturers, and professors because you sit in a class and people are Googling. And some of the things they're Googling in the academic arena, they don't have any academic credibility. And then they start asking you questions from Google. <laughs> now, the age of information explosion has both the merits and the demerits. Now, the merits is that today, I can preach today and some of my members can get this sermon after this. 
Somebody can get this someone from all the way to from Florida. Somebody can get this message in Australia. And therefore it has helped us in terms of disseminating and spreading the gospel of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Somebody say amen. But on the other hand, the negative part of it or the demerit part of it is that some people are Googling the wrong things. Young people are in pornography. Young people are Googling very filthy things that are busy destroying their life. I pray that God is going to save our generation from every destruction of the devil in the name of Jesus. Say amen. The third identity or tenet or principle of postmodernity is what I have called the clamor for alternative lifestyle. Now, the clamor for alternative lifestyle is the sheer disregard to God's blueprint of creation. God has created that a man and a woman will come together within the covenant of marriage. But the people who propagate alternative lifestyle have said that a man and a man can be married. A lie from the devil. When I'm saying amen. They say a woman and a woman can be joined together. Another lie from the devil. It goes against God's blueprint of marriage. Now, from my physics background, it even goes beyond the scientific it's called the scientific principle of lock and key hypothesis. Because the lock and key hypothesis says things goes like this. And the way we have been created, we take that lock and key hypothesis. The clamor for alternative lifestyle. And today they are coming out very boldly on the streets and telling us that they have the gay rights. They have the lesbian rights. Every right, right, right everywhere. A lie from the devil. One of those days I was preaching in one of the university and I was preaching on the same topic of postmodernity and two gentlemen came and confronted me after I had preached. They told me, Pastor, Tell me what is wrong with a man and a man marrying together. These are intellectual engineering students. I had to take them through the scriptures and tell them about God's original plan in his own scriptural master plan. Glory be to the name of Jesus. The next one is the challenge, the challenge of disregard to authority. If you have children who are disobeying you, that is part and parcel of the era of postmodernity. It begins right from the basic unit of the family. It moves to the society for those that are in authority. And it moves up to the point where people question the authority of the Holy Scriptures. So if you are a Bible study leader and those people don't listen to you, it is past of postmodernity. They don't come. Wame register like in our kujangi. Now asemi mbona wakuji. They have enlisted for ministry, but they never come for practice. They never come for prayer. It is part and parcel of questioning authority. Who are you to tell me? And that is the problem that we even have as the clergy. People no longer listen to the voice of the prophet or the voice of the priest. Jesus Christ says, my sheep hears my voice. But it's a complete contrast. It's a complete paradox in our generation today. You tell people we are going right. They go left. <laughs> they say, Pastor Utadu. Utadu is a phrase of impunity. Impunity in the church. Impunity in our homes. Actually, you tell them, don't watch this channel. That's the channel they'll watch. It is said that human being, you better even tell them, 
don't do this, then they'll do it. So pastor, you don't need to tell people, come for Wednesday prayer. Tell them, don't come. They will come. Because in a state of defiance, they defy the authority. They even question the credibility and the integrity of the Holy Scriptures. It is like Eve in the garden says, did God really say? Did God Really say, questioning the authority. Glory be to the name of Jesus. The last one is the clamor for religious pluralism. Plural, pluralism. It is a case where we are being persuaded to be accommodative to people's doctrinal persuasion and convictions. That you cannot just stand in your place of work and say, I am a Christian and today I want to pray and call upon Jehovah. We want to be accommodated. No wonder in our national function. Tunaanza, tunaomba na Hindu, wanaanza kuomba. Muislamu wanaomba. Ule jama wa ATR na kuja. Alafu pasa na kuja na takasa wote. Hey! Is... The age of religious pluralism. We want to be accommodative. In our schools, we want to be accommodative. I learned here in Machaga, in Maseno University, and we used to have even a mosque inside of the university. We want to be accommodative. It is part and parcel of religious pluralism. Postmodernism is a modern philosophy that shifts our attention from the supremacy of Christ and makes us to submit to other beliefs, to other philosophies that are not godly in our lives. And since we have said that there is nothing that is new under the sun, the Apostle Paul in the book of Colossians finds himself with the trends that were around Colossae Church. These guys were going through a Christ. The church was established under the leadership of Epaphras, who was the resident pastor of that particular church. But the church begins to receive a lot of uh, uh, contradictory doctrine from the people we call the Gnosticism. And they had uh, several heresies, and some of them I'll be mentioning even as we look at the biblical response. But Colossians, like Ephesians, Philippians, and Philemon, are actually captivity book. Paul writes these scriptures when he is in captivity under house arrest in Rome. No wonder he says that I am not present with you physically, but I am with you in the spirit. Glory be to the name of Jesus. Even in his, in his captivity, he begins to respond to some of the issues that we see in these particular scriptures. These people receive some modified teachings like today's philosophy of postmodernism of the 21st century. And they embrace what I have entitled as spiritual subsidy. In other words, Jesus is not enough. You have to mix Jesus with something. I have people who come to church, but they still go to visit diviners. I have people who come to church, they serve in the ministry, but they have some things that they have tied in their ways to protect them. That is what we call spiritual subsidy. In other words, you feel your business cannot prosper unless you go and add something, a subsidy on top. This teaching had infiltrated the church and, was this, and, they, and, and they were deceiving them to think that they had to add something on Jesus. And that is why the main theme of Colossians is the supremacy of Christ. Pastor Kiprop, what did we call it in Kalenjin? Jesus is enough. Yes. Tugul. And tool. 
<laughs> In my village we call it Yesu Oromo. Jesus is enough. To Gulen. Wow. I've come up with a very powerful calendar. I'm going to shine there with it. <laughs> Paul reminds them that Jesus himself is the very fullness of God. Everything is founded in him. Therefore, he is self-sufficient. You don't need to add anything. Some people talk about God helps those who help themselves. My friend, if you can help yourself, leave God alone. It is not even in the scriptures. But most of the times when we were in, in, in college and people want to use more Kenya, they say, you know, God. So a brother filled with the spirit is just dabbing. It tells them you have Jesus. You have already experienced his fullness. He has everything. He is the self-sufficient God. There is nothing that he cannot do. Because all the kingdoms of the earth bows down to him. Even the superpower kingdoms like the Babylonian powers had to respond by bowing down to him. Glory be to the name of Jesus. Allow me to take us through this exposition on three thematic areas, and then we shall pray. Number one is, is, suprema, is supremacy in prayer and stroke warfare. Is supremacy in prayer and warfare. That is chapter 2, verse 1 to 3. Number two, his supremacy in falsehood and heresy. Verse 4 to 5. And lastly, his supremacy against human philosophy from verse 6 to 10. Let's begin with the first one. His supremacy in prayer stroke warfare. Verse 1 says, I want you to know how much I have agonized for you and for the church at Laodicea. Now, other version says, I want you to know how hard I'm contending for you. Other version says, I want you to know how I'm wrestling in prayer for you. Prayer is one of the spiritual warfare that can help us to fight all the negative trends of postmodernism. God, I pray that in Sitam Eldoret, God is going to raise up some spiritual, some spiritual giants, some men and women who can intercede for this church and commit it into the hands of God because that is the only way that Eldoret shall hear the gospel of the kingdom of God. I pray that the Lord is going to raise up some intercessors that are going to kneel down, lift up their voice to God, worship the Lord and tell God our generation is not going to go into postmodernism, but they will rise up to serve you for the glory and for the praise of God. I pray that the Lord is going to raise up some women like my old mother who used to wake up at, at, at 3 a.m. to Pray for us, mention us by name, the seven of us, and today we are preachers because of that investment of prayer. I pray that God is going to raise up some men like Paul, like Paul who are going to wrestle in prayer. They may be in captivity. Things may be difficult in their lives. Things may be tough in their lives. But they rise up a voice to God and worship him and wrestle in prayer for the glory and for the praise of God. Paul was a great spiritual con Paul uh, had a great spiritual conflict. The Bible says he wrestled in prayer against satanic forces, against anything that exalted itself above the knowledge of the word of God. He knew the only way to defeat satanic forces was by prayer. Postmodernism requires man who can wrestle the enemy in prayer and take out every weapon out of them and begin to celebrate the goodness of the Lord. 
I want to tell us because of the complication and the philosophy behind postmodernism, it will not just take us uh, to go the intellectual way or what we call apologetic, but it will take some men who are going to rise up and pray and, 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 and pray that the Lord is going to deliver our generation. I pray that the Lord is going to raise such men in the mighty name of Jesus. Now, Colossians chapter 4 verse 12, Paul talks about Epaphras. And I've already said that Epaphras was a resident pastor of the Colossian church like Pastor Buire. And he says, Epaphras, Colossians chapter 4 verse 12, Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, sends greetings. He always is always wrestling in prayer for you. That you may stand firm in all the will of God and mature and fully assured. We pray that the Lord is going to raise some men that are, you know, prayer is a very strenuous exercise. No wonder Paul uses the word wrestling. If you want to see the most unpopular meetings in Sitam, for the last 10 years that I've been serving in Sitam, the most unpopular service is the prayer service. It is where two or three are gathered. <laughs> it is where two or three are gathered by his name. On Sunday, we celebrate mega churches and big churches like Sitam Eldoret. But on Wednesday, my friend, oh, oh, I'm busy, Pastor. You know, I close late. Oh, oh Pastor, Sam came, Pastor, something came up, even in Eldoret, where we don't have a lot of jam. Oh, Pastor, jam. But I tell you, ladies and gentlemen, if only God could raise some men. And that is why in the book of Ezekiel, he says, I look for a man, Ezekiel chapter 22, verse 30, I look for a man who could stand in the gap. I look for somebody who could give himself and pray on behalf of Israel so that when I'm applying my justice system, I may rescue my people. Israel had sinned, and under God's justice system, they deserved to be punished. But God says, I look for a man. God could be waiting for somebody. That person could be an HOD in this church. That person could be an elder in this church. That person could be a pastor in this church. That person could be a Bible study in this church. That person could be in the worship team. That person could be in the traffic ministry. God is waiting for that man that can stand in the gap and pray. And wrestle with him. Second Colossians chapter 10 verse 4 to 6 says, The weapons we fight are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments. Look at that. Every pretension that sets itself against the knowledge of God. And we take captive of every thought. To make it to be obedient to Christ. Paul agrees that the weapons we are fighting are not physical weapons. In other words, he says, if this battle could be won by a grenade, we could go to the barracks and get grenades. If this battle could be won by G5, we could go to the barracks and get those weapons. If this battle could be won by, by AK-47, we could go to the police and win it. But this is not a physical battle. This is not the battle in Haiti. This battle is spiritual and therefore it requires a spiritual battle to fight it. 
One of the weapons that God has given us is called prayer. Prayer is both an offensive and defensive weapon. When we pray, something happens in our lives. Are there grand grandparents here who are tired of their children going into drugs? Are there parents here who are tired of their parents going into drugs? Can you begin to wake up and begin to pray? Begin to groan for them? Begin to prophesy over their lives? And something will happen in the name of Jesus. Paul longed long for the saints to be united in Christ and join the riches of his blessing. And he says in verse 3, in Christ we have all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. No wonder nowadays when they need a good accountant, they come to churches so that we pastors may give them reference. Because you are full of knowledge and wisdom. When you are in Christ, you have the treasures of Christ's wisdom and knowledge. Glory be to the name of the Lord. Let's go to number two. His supremacy in falsehood and heresy. Verse 4 says, I tell you so that no one may deceive you by fine sounding argument. For though I'm absent from you in body, I'm present in spirit and delight to see how disciplined you are and how firm your faith is in Christ. Now, in this scripture, Paul actually responds to some of the arguments that were being peddled around as heresies. Now, now the first one, they said angels must be worshipped. Chapter 2, verse 18. Paul says, angels are not to be worshipped. Christ alone is to be worshipped. Angels are messengers. In fact, don't even call your children angels because angels are messengers. The angels need to be serving your children. He says, don't worship the angels. Worship Christ and Christ alone. Number two, they say one must follow the religious ceremonies and rituals to be saved or perfected. These are the subsidies. Add the ceremony. Add the rituals. Paul is saying, those rituals were only shadows of the reality to come through Christ. So whether they are rituals in Leviticus, done by the ironic wing of the Levitical wing of the church, they say those were the shadows to come. Because even in the priesthood, Jesus Christ came as the high priest. And therefore, they were just shadows that were a precursor to the reality to come. Glory be to the name of Jesus. They also argue that Christ is not both human and divine. When Christ was on earth, he was 100% human and 100% God with no intermediate. They did believe in the incarnation of Christ. And if you read chapter 1 verse 15 to 20, Paul is saying, Christ is the incarnate God in the flesh. He is an eternal one, head of the body. First in everything and supreme. He existed even before postmodernism and therefore supreme above postmodernity in the name of Jesus. He says, whatever you are peddling are mere falsehood and heresies. The last one, his supremacy against human philosophy. Verse 6 says, so then, just as you have received Christ as Lord, continue to live your lives in him. I pray that somebody may continue to live his lives in him. For the 30 years you have been saved, may you continue. 
For the six months you have been saved, may you continue. For the one month you have been saved, may you continue. For the two years you have been saved, may you continue to live your life in him. Rooted and built up in him, strengthened in faith as you are taught and overflowing with thanksgiving. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human traditions and the elemental spiritual forces of the world, rather than on Christ. For in Christ, all fullness of deity lives in bodily form. And in Christ, you have been brought to fullness. He is the head over every power as the music team comes. So there are three things that we see in this scripture. Number one, the instruction to believe. The instruction to believe. It says, live your life in him. Tell your neighbor, live your life in him. Be rooted and built up. And strengthen in faith. So that if when every wind of doctrine comes, you are stable in your faith. Shakahola does not shake you. There are no cars that shake you. Because you are in Christ Jesus. You are built up in him. You live by him. You, 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 your, the spirit of God dwells in you. In the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. And then he tells us the things to avoid. He says, let no one take captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy which depends on human tradition and elemental forces of the world rather than Christ. He says, this philosophy, you are going to get it from these academicians, these opinions, uh, 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 philosophers. But let no one deceive you so that you may deviate from Christ. So whether it is postmodern philosophy, let no one deviate you. Let no one tell you that all roads lead to Rome. No, that's a lie from the devil. Jesus is the way. Jesus is the truth and the life. And no man comes to the Father except by him. And then lastly, he tells them about the description of his supremacy. He talks about fullness of deity that lives in him. The Holy Spirit lives in him. And Christ is you, in you is all sufficient. Tell somebody it is all sufficient. If you can say in mother tongue, tell somebody Christ is sufficient with your mother tongue. Hey! He is all sufficient. He is the head of every power, every dominion. That is why demons bow to him because he has the fullness of deity in, inside of him. The Bible says that he who is in Christ is a new creation. The old is gone and behold the new has come. The Bible says if God be for us who shall be against us? He says no weapon that has been formed against us shall be able to prosper but every tongue that shall rise against us shall be able to con to be condemned in the name of Jesus. I tell my people in my chakos that please if you fear these witches ask me to go and stay next to them. The other time I was telling them that even if I get a crate of egg near my door, I will take that crate of egg and prepare a good omelette. Na pili pili kwa umbali. And I'll take a nice breakfast because the Lord has provided. Because I'm serving a great God.
God, the God of Shadrach, the God of Meshach and Abednego, the God of Abraham, the God of Jacob, the God of Isaac. I don't know which God you're serving. I don't know what they're planning about your children. I don't know what they're planning about your business. I don't know how they're planning about your business. When you call upon Jesus, something happens in your life. He is supreme. He is supreme. He is the powerful God in your life in the name of Jesus. I want us to rise up on our feet and worship this God. Lift up his name. Magnify his name in the name of Jesus. Oh, shakatalabaza. Roho wabwana twa kwali kauta wa. to Jesus. The Lord is in this place. Shut the hell up, shut the 